Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We want to call the meeting to order. A few details. Everybody is muted with the video turned off to conserve bandwidth and enhance the performance of Zoom. The meeting is being recorded and a link will be forwarded to all of those who couldn't attend so that they can view it. If you have any questions, I use the chat box. Any questions you have or to make any comments, we have somebody monitoring. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a chance to acknowledge all of our award participants. Uh, for the optimal viewing, choose view speaker or view active speaker as your viewing option. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Abby Bolich, the 21-22 Dallas County Master Gardener Association president for her welcome and opening remarks. Um, hello everyone, um, this is Abby Bolish. Um, welcome to our February 2021 monthly meeting. Um, we have a wonderful speaker today, uh, Stephen C. Wooster, C. Wooster, who will be speaking about basil, king of herbs, and our MC of local fame, Mary Kay Isep, will present the awards for 2020. Um, I would like to introduce Jeff Raska, our Master Garden Coordinator, for his opening remarks. Uh, Jeff, are you there? Okay, I am here and I'm ready. Thank you, Abby. Good, good morning, guys. Good morning, team. Exciting day. It's always exciting when we can give awards to our, to our members and all the hard work and recognize all the hard work you all do. I know how hard this year has been. I know it's been a year for all of us. It's been certainly not expected, and, um, not what we asked for, but I tell you what, I couldn't have had a better team to go through this year with. Your patience uh, in, in helping me with stewardship through this program, through the, through the end of the COVID from last year and through this new year coming through. Uh, it's such a it's so appreciated by me. You guys have been a great help to me, my leadership team, all the way through all my master gardeners in the field. And uh, things are getting better. Things will get better. We're going to go forward, and we will. This program is only getting stronger. What we've done, and what I've under, what I know we've done is we've learned some new ways to communicate, some new ways to address the public, some new ways that are we put some new uh, some glitter on our face. Uh, our public face. So things have gotten better out of this. We're going to take this and make the best out of it. And we already have. We'll come out of this when we get back to some normalcy and get back to seeing each other again. I was thinking about this the other day when I was doing a, a lecture about how much we miss each other, seeing each other, just getting to visit, talk person to person. I mean, Zoom is fine. and It's, it's a meeting we have to use, but it's not the same as sitting in there and getting to visit and getting to see each other. Well, that day will come again. And we'll be able to get together and get to see each other and visit with each other again. And that's such a big part of our program, the, the relationships and the fellowships, not just the education part, but the fellowship part when we're all getting together, and getting to visit and get to see our friends again. But uh, I'm so happy that uh, we got to today to be able to hand out these awards. And uh, thank you for so much you've done this year. We're going to get better and it's getting better and things are changing. And uh, we're going to be we're going to be fine through this just as long as we're all healthy that's the main thing staying healthy and i will I, as we've always said over and over again with my leadership team and cynthia is my communicator with this is everything we do is for you guys for your health for your well-being when we make decisions with the program with the leadership team with the advisory we always take your interest at first at first hand in your health interest and we always have and we always will but be getting together soon and I'll be looking forward to uh, getting to see you out in the field and coming to visit you a little bit out in the field. But uh, good, it's a fun day, good day today. So uh, thank you for the team that put this awards together. And if you need anything from me, please let me know. Just let me know if you need anything. If you have any questions or anything for me, I'm always here for you. Just let me know what you need. So Miss Abby, it is all yours, my darling. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, okay, um, a few announcements. Um, first off, uh, the update on the Japanese uh, maple tree fundraiser. We have sold out of all of our trees 
and are excitedly waiting for our delivery on Friday and Saturday, March 12th and 13th. Um, you saw those directions in the sign up genus. And uh, thank you to everyone who volunteered to help with this program. And also big thank you to all who purchased those wonderful trees. Can't wait to see pictures of them next year when we possibly will do this again. Um, I would like to uh, send a shout out to our wonderful Helping Hands crew, um, led by the talented Julie Garza. Um, Julie and her team of writers, editors, and proofreaders help, help make Helping Hands a valuable asset for the Dallas County Master Gardener Association. And a big thank you to Julie for all her hard work. So thank you team. Um, the uh, program spotlight for today is going to be the uh, greenhouse uh, at Texas Discovery Gardens. Roseanne Ferguson will speak about TDG. Roseanne is a member of the Speakers Bureau and speaks on many topics. She became a master gardener in 2008 and holds many awards and recognitions. Please welcome Roseanne Ferguson. Roseanne, all yours. Hello everyone, and welcome to the greenhouse at Texas Discovery Gardens, where the magic happens. Next. No, not that kind of magic. Next. We play in the dirt, uh, uh -huh. soil. Next. To work our kind of magic. Next. Whether it's producing plants for our house and patio plant sale. Next. Or putting the finishing touches on our native plants for the native plant sale. Next. Our volunteers are indispensable as we produce well over 10,000 plants annually. The TDG Greenhouse is a center of work, but it is also a center of education. Volunteers frequently comment that they learn something new every single time they volunteer. They share valuable gardening experiences as they work, and they learn new horticultural techniques as they propagate and tend to the plants in the greenhouse. Next. The plants produced in the TDG greenhouse are important for many reasons. Many homes in the DFW Metroplex are enhanced by plants purchased at the TDG plant sales. Many school gardens include plants donated or heavily discounted by TDG. Plants are also provided for the Butterfly Conservatory and gardens of TDG. Pollinator habitats have been installed in multiple city parks throughout Dallas County. Most of these plants are propagated from seeds and cuttings by our wonderful volunteers. Next. To say that this past year has been challenging is a vast understatement. All of this was accomplished while we carefully tried to avoid the COVID pandemic. We wore our masks, we washed our hands and we maintained social distancing. It was a challenging year, but our volunteers met the challenges with grace and determination. Next. So 
we have beautiful plants and a cozy greenhouse, but something is missing. And that something is actually someone. And that someone is you. Next. If you are interested in becoming a part of this exciting volunteer group in the greenhouse at Texas Discovery Gardens, please contact me by email at rferguson at verizon.net. And it's also on the member roster on the Master Gardener website. There is always something new and exciting happening in the greenhouse and you can be an important part of that action. We are located in historic Fair Park and the hours are generally nine to noon on weekdays. So come be a part of the magic in the greenhouse. And now I am so happy to introduce our next speaker, our own intrepid Mary Kay Estep. Well, good morning to everybody. I have the joy of introducing the, our speaker of the year and our speaker for today. Our speaker of the year is Stephen C. Wester. And Stephen joined the Speakers Bureau after completing his Master Gardener training in 2015. His career in communications and public relations served him well as he launched a new career, sharing his expertise and love of gardening with others as a frequently requested speaker. Stephen's love of all aspects of gardening is contagious, whether he talks about starting your first garden, raising those luscious vine-ripe tomatoes, harvesting basil to make pesto, growing your own fruit trees, tending oriental vegetables in community gardens, or just creating a compost pile. We congratulate Stephen and wish him further success as he continues to expand his list of topics to share with others. So let's now hear from Stephen. Well, hello everyone. This is a, a new experience. For, um, Considering that my internet went out at my house this morning, I met my friend Larry Thompson, who's graciously set me up at his house so we can continue with uh, the speech for today. You know, in a normal speech, I present detailed information regarding garden topics like, you know, beginning a garden or fall gardening or salad gardens and basic composting. But I always wanted to do a presentation on my favorite herb, basil. So I decided this was the perfect audience to indulge my passion. So pardon me for not getting too technical in this particular talk. You know, it's great than us that when speakers like, like me provide gardening information for our audience, but you know, once you've grown a particular vegetable or herb, sometimes you need to know what to do with it to fulfill, you know, the joy and pride you have experienced growing it. So today, what I will explore is where this one herb led me from the garden to the kitchen and ultimately to Epicurean delight. Next slide, please. This is our, where we, we tell everybody about uh, who we are, but today what we're going to discuss is we're gonna look at basil, talk a little bit about the history, medical uses, some of the many varieties, how to grow basil, and then I'm going to give you the tips, the things that I've learned uh, in my basil journey. Then we will also talk a little bit about pesto. What is it? How do you make it? Uh, recipes and, and uses for basil. And again, I'm going to give you some tips on the things that I've learned about making pesto and using pesto. Also, we may have time, we'll have a little bit about the other uses of basil and basil and pesto resources. Next slide, please. And not many people know the history of basil, but actually the word basil comes from the Greek. It means king. And it was believed to have grown above the spot where St. Constantine and Helen discovered the Holy Cross. 
The Oxford Dictionary quotes Basil, uh, speculations that basil may have been used in some royal unguent bath or medicine, and it's still considered the king of herbs by many. And then you switch to the other part of the world over in Asia, especially India, uh, it was used in um, courtrooms to have Indians swear their oaths upon. But the, the basil that we know the most about really has more of the European um, tie to the Italian basil, which symbolizes love. Supposedly Italian suitors showed their love by wearing a spring of basil in his hair to win his heart's desire. And you know, in Mexico, people would keep basil in their pockets, hoping the man or woman they loved would return that love forever. And in Romania, a place I have visited, a man would give basil to his love and they would officially be engaged. So that's kind of the history of the, the king, the king of herbs, basil. Next slide, please. Now also, you may not know that, that basil has some medical uses. Historically, uh, as you can see, a lot of them are, are similar. A lot of intestinal stomach issues supposedly were improved by uh, ingesting basil. But as you can see, some, some places they used it for co uh, colds, uh, intestinal worms, an antibacterial, but most of them had something to do with soothing the stomach. Now to get in the current environment, we're gonna get into some words and things that are a little over my head, but we're gonna pass them along to you anyway. Um, basil contains polyphenolic flavonoids, antioxidants that prevent cell damage. Well, that sounds positive. Also, it contains eugenol, citronella, and linalol. Those are, I think, all the things that smell really good, but supposedly have anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties. Basil also has beta carotene. We've all heard of that, vitamin A, and, and a lot of other uh, agents that act against free radicals that helped uh, play a, a role in, in slowing down aging, which is something I'm sure we're all interested in. Also, zeanathan filters harmful UV rays in the retina that helps protect against macular disease in the eye. And basil is an excellent source of iron, which is a component of hemoglobin in red blood cells. So that's for all, all, all the medical issues for, for basil. So next slide, please. Now, as you probably know, there are, there are a lot of different kinds of basil. Here's some that you maybe have heard of. There's the African uh, blue basil. Um, Usually it's, it's dramatic because it has uh, the streaks of, of purple through the, through the regular uh, green leaves. And the pink and purple flowers have a camphor scent to them, um, which is a, it's a great thing to uh, say, put in a bouquet. Also looks nice and smells nice in your garden. There's cinnamon basil. Um, this is an attractive plant. As a matter of fact, uh, whenever I smell it, I always think I'd, I'd like to learn how to make Ices, you know, instead of ice cream, the, the ices, you don't have cream in it. I just think that cinnamon basil would make a great ice, kind of a light ice to, to ingest in the, in, the summer, in the summer heat here in Texas. It's best in fruit salads, herbal teas, and some Mediterranean dishes. The next one is probably the most well-known and the one that, that most people enjoy, this Genovese. It's the classic large leaf Italian type with um, I like it because it is actually the perfect, perfect basil for pesto making. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. There's also a holy basil, which goes back to some of the religious, um, I think in Asia, particularly in India, sacred basil, and also Italian large leaf or, or lettuce leaf, or sometimes it's called Napolitano. And these are really, really large leaves, and I really, really like uh, that basil also. Next slide. And then of course, there's some, some other basils. Uh, maybe you've heard of them. There's lemon basil. Uh, maybe you've heard of the strain Mrs. Burns. That's the one I see most often when I'm, I'm looking in the, in the uh, garden centers. Um, it's nice for uh, just kind of freshening up some of, your, some of your dishes. I've also found a lime basil before. I didn't find it as distinctive as, as the lemon, but uh, there's a mammoth, which is similar to the large leaf ones, uh, which can be used as 
in, in cooking. And it's a little different because it's so large, you can actually use it as a lettuce wrap, which is kind of an interesting different way to, uh, to use basil. And then there are some, uh, red Reuben is one that, uh, you know, has a kind of a, a dark color um, and uh, looks really good in, in the middle of your garden for something a little uh, different than just all of the green leaves. It's purple bronze leaves. Um, and you can also use it to make pesto also. Now here's the one that really changes. It's the Siam Queen or the Thai basils. And I think those are really interesting. I think my love of uh, the original Genovese pesto is what, um, what I was aiming at. And this is the one I learned a lot about, Siam Queen. And I noticed as I started going to Asian restaurants, a lot of people use uh, Siam Queen. And also another one you'll see uh, in the stores around here is a spicy globe, which is a, a, a much smaller plant uh, with small leaves. And uh, another one that, again, has a fragrant, fragrant smell. So next slide, please. Basil is very easy to grow. I probably don't need to tell all of you this. It's, um, first of all, you just choose a location with great drainage. Um, it, does, it does need to be good drainage. It doesn't like to sit in a bunch of, a bunch of wet soil. Um, choose a location with good sun. For me, I found that basil doesn't really like our July and August summer afternoons. So I always prefer an Eastern exposure. If I can get six to eight hours uh, of sunlight, my basil loves it because it really does dry out fast in the, in the heat. One of the, one of the things you have to decide is how are you going to grow basil? Are you going to use seeds? Or are you going to use plants? Um, seeds are, I don't know if you've ever seen basil seeds, but they are tiny, tiny, tiny little black seeds. Um, if you, if you want to choose those, you just kind of scatter them around in, in the place that you, you've chosen, put a little dirt on them and water them thoroughly. Personally, I usually start them in a pot. I will, I will spread, spread them in a pot and wait till the seedlings come in. And then I, then, uh, I hire my propagation specialist, my wife, Mary Lou, and she, she normally separates those seedlings into smaller pots so I can let the um, basil grow larger and those that I use in the garden are, are given away to my, my family and friends. If you choose to grow basil plants, it's, it's so simple. You just get the plant, you dig a small hole, you tease out the root ball and plant it in the ground, but you do have to water it thoroughly. And I, I, I will note that you do have to keep an eye on your basil plants in the summer because they will show that they're getting dry very quickly. One of the quickest plants in my herb garden that looks a little wilted. So you, once they start looking a little wilted, they do need to get a little bit, a little bit of water and they will show their appreciation very quickly. They soak up that water, but do keep an eye on watering. You also have to uh, worry about the temperature. They are very, they're very um, sensitive to cold and even a light frost will kill them. So uh, sometimes what you might want to do is at the end of the summer is have a few basil plants that you may have in, have in pots that you can bring inside if we're in one of those days where it gets close to freezing. They really don't like the freezing weather and they will die. And another thing that you have to do with basil optimally is to harvest it very, very often. Um, the more you harvest basil, the more it will grow. And when you're ready to harvest, you pinch uh, on the stem right above where there's a pair of leaves growing. And then you will have two stems that will grow in that same place, which means you'll have twice the leaves next time you harvest. Another important thing is when it flowers, you do need to pick the flowers because if you don't, the taste isn't as intense in the leaves. So, and then once you do pick those flowers off, it will renew the, the, the flavor back into the leaves. Next slide, please. Again, uh, I usually grow my basil outside. I don't have quite as much luck inside, although I do have some in my, in my winter uh, greenhouse this year. But for some reason, they always seem to like the, the outdoors a lot better. Um, as we've talked about, they're sensitive to cold. Um, if you're going to grow them indoors, a pot on a sunny windowsill is the best way to go away from the cold drafts. Uh, I've had very good luck with them um, 
my basil this year in the greenhouse, although I do have to water it still a lot more than I do anything else that's in my greenhouse. And you can grow them under uh, fluorescent lights. And then sometimes if you go out in the garden and you ac actually cut maybe a little bit too much basil, more than you need, that's not a problem. What you, when you come in, just take the leaves off the bottom of the stem and stick the stem into a, into a, a small cup of water and it will be happy on a windowsill. Um, and you'll notice that maybe within a week or two, you'll start getting little, you'll, you'll start getting roots and you can actually replant those plants. So it's a, it's a very cooperative plant in, in, my, in my ID. Could you, uh, next slide please. Of course, I've told you basil thrives in the outdoors, but does not like the dead uh, summer heat at the in the afternoon. So I would try to keep it out of the afternoon uh, after two, three o'clock sun. Um, you know, if a stem produces mature flowers, that leaf production uh, slows and the stem becomes woody. So when you do cut these plants, you wanna cut them in a way that you know that when you cut them, they're going to, two more stems are gonna come out of it. So you wanna kind of shape your plant so that it doesn't come be, become too top heavy so that it bushes out a little bit more. Once the plant produces flowers, it may produce seed pods and they contain those little black seeds which can be saved and planted the following year. And even if you don't save them, they will drop off if left in the, in the garden long enough and you may get some beautiful volunteers the next year. So. Um, I, I highly recommend reusing your, your seeds from, use, from year to year. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the lessons I've learned from basil. The, the photo you see there is actually in the Cinque Terre. And this is where I kind of first got turned on to basil. It's what inspired me to grow and use basil. In 2007, we went on a trip to Italy and we visited the Cinque Terre. And I had a conversation, even though I don't speak Italian, and the Airbnb gentleman that was hosting me, he didn't speak English, but once we got into the garden and we talked about basil, we had a wonderful time. And meanwhile, my wife was in his mother's kitchen where she was schooling her on the art of making pesto. And as they say in Italian, pesto presto. I've tried drying basil, but found it loses its fragrance and flavor when dried. So I have found that freezing it in ice cubes is the best way to preserve. You can then drop these cubes in soup, soups or stews. Again, Genovese by far is definitely the best variety for, for pesto. Now to get a, a jump on the season, sometimes while I, I do um, start from seed and, and then do seedlings and plant, you can, there's actually a couple of places other than the big box stores, the usual Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart kinds of places. I like Sprouts and Trader Joe's. They usually have really good looking basil and it's not that expensive. And every time I get their little pot, there's usually three, four, maybe even five plants in there. It's a really, really good bargain and you can get a good start right as you get uh, probably in the later part of March when we're getting near the end, end of the freezing se se season. You know, um, don't forget to pick off those flowers and pick and cut that basil fresh. But what I really like is the basil leaves, particularly the big leaves. Uh, I use them instead of lettuce, instead of a BLT, one of my favorite sandwiches, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Mine is a BBT. So I always have bacon, basil, and tomato, and it really ups the flavor on, on, that, uh, on that particular sandwich. And of course, how do you say it? Basil or ba basil? Depends if you're in Texas, I guess, or if you're in London. Next slide, please. So what is pesto? Some of us know, I didn't know a lot about pesto until we were in Italy. It's an Italian sauce. It's very thick and it's usually made up of ingredients, basil, garlic, salt, pine nuts, olive oil, and, and usually Parmesan cheese. Although some commercial pestos have other have other um, nuts in there. I really prefer um, the, the classic ones. 
And you can store pesto once you've made it in the refrigerator for up to four weeks or in, you can put it in the freezer. We usually, we usually freeze ours at the end of the season and we have it all through the winter and spring until it's time to make fresh pesto again the next year. I make pesto every summer and I also make variations including sun-dried tomato pesto and Asian pesto. Um, and I think we're going to go to the next slide and we're gonna talk a little bit about making pesto. Classic pesto and the easiest way to do it is get all your ingredients together and I just get an old fashioned blender. I put in a cup of olive oil, put in a half cup of pine nuts. You can actually roast those nuts if you want a little different flavoring and eight cloves of garlic. And you do that to taste and it depends on how big or small the, the garlic cloves are. But I put those three items in and then I, I blend it until it's smooth. Then I take my two cups of, of clean and dried packed basil and I take a small part of the handful in there and slowly break that down in the blender until you get a nice wet paste. And then when you're done, after you've, you've got the consistency you want, that's when you would add your, your cheese. You would fold it in, I don't blend it in. Then you can put it in a container, you can refrigerate up to two to four weeks. You can store, sometimes I used to do it where I just put them in ice cube trays, the pesto right in there and put those uh, trays right in the freezer. And then once they're frozen, I usually would break them out of the ice cube trays into a big freezer Ziploc bag and put it back into the freezer. Next slide, please. Here's a couple of the uh, other ways I use pesto. So you get done making your pesto and you have this blender and you have all this pesto that's stuck to the side. What, what I do, what I do is I add uh, water and vinegar and oil into the bottom, uh, just, just like you would uh, making your own salad dressing. And I clean the pesto out with those ingredients. And then I have a beautiful pesto salad dressing. And uh, that way you're not, you're not uh, wasting any of that precious pesto. Uh, with my little grandsons, I always buy my, my grandsons, I bought them the Dr. Seuss book, Green Eggs and Ham. And they're, after they've read that, I teach them about making green eggs and ham, which basically is in, when I'm making scrambled eggs, if you've made some pesto, just put your eggs and, and milk in, in the blender and it'll take all that beautiful pesto and turn, turn the eggs green and then you can have green eggs and ham. Of course, our, our go-to dish is chicken pesto pasta. That's when we have leftover chicken, when uh, uh, either a roasted chicken or whatever chicken you have, even canned chicken, you can just uh, fry up some um, mushrooms, onions and, and meat. And then uh, I put in the pesto and I use uh, for the pasta, I always use for folly, which is the bow ties, because uh, it seems that the, the uh, pesto will cling to all the little nooks and crannies in there. Another thing you do is pesto spread as a substitute for, for mayo on sandwiches. Next slide, please. These are some of the other basil pestos I'm, I make. Uh, these are the three that I make the most. Um, Asian pesto, uh, and that's where you're using half and half cilantro and Thai basil. You're using peanut or grapeseed oil. You're not using cheese. That's the one difference in the Asian pestos. Then I do a sun-dried tomato pesto, which is a variation on the uh, Genovese regular basil pesto. And that's where I, uh, I cut back a little bit on the oil and I uh, put sun-dried tomatoes in there along with the Genovese. That's one of my favorites. I happen to really like it with pistachios. And then um, again, you, you, you do the uh, directions just like I, I showed you in the, in the previous slides on making classic pesto. Next slide, please. So the, the lessons I've learned is you always mix the pesto ingredients, you blend them, you put them in a food processor, but you, you slowly add the cheese in. And what should you use? Parmesan, fresh grated, store-bought that's already grated, or in the green container? Well, when I'm freezing it, I always put, I just put some of the is just in the green container, uh, just to have it in that pesto. So if I give it away to someone, there will already be some cheese in there. But I never serve uh, anything with my pesto without doing some fresh grated Parmesan or, or Romano on top of it. 
And this also led, led me, I was using so much garlic with my pesto to start growing my own garlic. And it is the easiest thing in the world. I plant mine in October, start pulling them in May to June. So that, uh, that's been a great way to, to go beyond just the, the basil. Uh, you can use other nuts. You can try pine nuts, pistachios, almonds, walnuts. Didn't have as much luck with pecan, but you can try, try all those things. Um, and this, the storing tip is that you should always refrigerate, but you can freeze it and try different herb combinations of other pestos. And as you can see, I even have, I have the only pesto license plate in the state of Texas, which I'm very proud of. And uh, gets me a lot of questions when I'm in the, in the parking lot of a lot of our garden centers. Okay, I think we're close to out of time. So let's go forward on another slide. And um, we've talked a little bit about some of the other uses, culinary use. Go to the next slide, please. And then I also have 10 unusual ways to use basil, which I won't go into, but I've I put it up here because I have it in my next slide, which is all of the... Uh, um, all of the resources for basil and pesto that are on there. And what I really want you to make sure and look at is the, the book on the very top, Basil and Herb Lover's Guide. This is the definitive book on, on basil. It is very difficult to find. I don't know if it's still in print. I searched and searched and I finally found one at a half price uh, books. Uh, and actually I believe I got one uh, when I ordered another one uh, it was their last ones that they had, and I actually had the author sign it for me. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you uh, indulge my uh, uh, passion of, of pesto and good luck cooking. And now I think it's time to turn it back over to Abby. And thank you very much, Stephen. That was wonderful. Um, I think uh, Mary Kay is going to be up next. Um, so let me introduce her. Um, Mary Kay Isak is our uh, MC, and she has been an, a master gardener uh, dedicated to our program since 2009 and has been a coordinator at the Master Gardener School a vice president, a membership board member, and a volunteer at the past Service Gardens, Athletes for Change, Salvation Army Playground and Courtyard Garden, and Make-A-Wish Foundation. She is now serving on the nominations committee for 2021. Um, and so please welcome Mary Kay Isak. Hi everyone. I'm just going to start. It's so exciting to see you and welcome you to the 2020 Master Gardener Achievement Awards. The um, <clears throat> It's always such an honor to be a part of this program and this year it's especially fun as I get to join you at your kitchen table or your study or even your be bedroom. Well, let's all get cozy and recognize some of our outstanding members. It's been said, the greatest oak was once a little nut who held its ground. Well, I feel like this year we've all experienced the feeling of that little nut. It hasn't been easy achieving our goals and acquiring all our volunteer and educational hours, but thanks to our leadership, for working with us and providing ways to do that. And thanks to you, the little nuts, who have persevered and grown so much. Next slide, please. We know we usually have over a million dollars worth of volunteer hours, but under the circumstances of this year, I think we've done a great job. We had a total of 32,666 volunteer hours. And, and you can see that's an average of 78 hours each. 
Well, I know I didn't get 78 hours in. So somebody got more than their share for sure. So um, we also were able to contribute 8,800 and, oh, wait, I'm sorry. The little words keep covering it up. <laughs> 8,800. 8, thousand eighty oh good grief eight hundred eighty eight thousand five hundred twenty two dollars worth of volunteer credits i think that's wonderful next slide over over the last couple of years we have recreated the class captain role in our association some classes have been combined while others take two to three people to care for their group the captains get their information from TIG and will help the class keep up with their certification details, membership dues to the association, and other needs of our members. These people are on call and your connection to the administration. So thank you to all of these caring, dedicated souls. And if you have not had a contact from your class captain, you can see your year of uh, joining and see who that is. Thank you to all of you. Next. Wow, look at this. These eight interns were able to achieve at least 100 hours during this challenging time. Wonder what the future holds for them. Congratulations to all of you. Next. Well, we should all give a round of applause for this group. These are the Go-Getter members who earned at least 100 hours during this year. Aren't our gardens lucky to have them? It's been said, gardening adds years to your life and life to your years. Well, with this kind of dedication, these gardeners will be around for quite a while. Next. Well, our bronze pen award is for accumulation of 250 hours. This may be over one, two, or three or more years. And thank you to all of these people for supporting our gardens. Next. Well, in our silver pen, is for the accumulation of 500 hours. Just think how long that is. What an honor. This takes a lot of dedication. It's fun to look at these because you have people from all different classes, which makes it uh, fun to see how, it, how long it takes to accumulate these hours. Next. And our goal pin is for the accumulation of 1,000 hours. That's a lot of work. These ladies are the ones you always see working at our projects and events. Thank you, thank you for all your time and efforts. Next. Well, Lois and Denise, congratulations. The trial pen is for an accumulated 2,500 hours. Well, of course, I had to figure that out. And that's over 104 24 hour days. Wow. I'm sure sometimes they feel like they've worked that long and hard. <laughs> this is quite an accomplishment. Next. Well, what can I say? Our lovely rose pin goes to Linda Alexander and Ann Lamb, honoring their accumulation of 5,000 hours. Ladies, that's incredible. And you have set a standard high for all of us to follow. Thank you so much. Next. Well, I love the Dirty Dozen Award. <clears throat> this recognizes our top 12 volunteer contributors during the year. And the interesting part is that it's only given one time, or the, the pen is only given once. And the repeat qualifiers receive an honorable mention. 
So you have your new ones and the honorable mention. This group is a perfect example of a quote by Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling. Gardens are not made by singing, oh, how beautiful, and sitting in the shade. Because this dirty dozen works hard to see that the work is done and done well. Let's see our new dirty dozen. Next slide. Oh, gosh. And there they are. The Dirty Dozen, John Ellis, Julie Garza, Jackie James, Ellen Schwab, and Sherry Walker. An honorable mention, these have been in this group before, include Linda Alexander, Barry Bloom, Sandra Ferris, Roseanne Ferguson, Cynthia Jones, Denise Struber, and Tig Thompson. Congratulations to all of you. This is really quite an honor. Next. Well, and we were lucky enough to hear from Stephen a while ago, who has been awarded the Speaker of the Year for this year. I think we all enjoyed his um, speech immensely, and hopefully, Stephen, we can get some of those recipes. Congratulations to you, for this is quite an award. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Cynthia because she has some um, special awards to honor. Good morning, everyone. The Shooting Star Award, it recognizes members for their outstanding contributions to the association, to the Master Gardener program and to Texas A&M AgriLife. Every year, recipients are chosen by the president in consultation with the board. While we have many members who contribute in very special ways every year, the Shooting Star pin is awarded only once to a member. So the Shooting Star recipients for 2020 are Beverly Allen, Olga Arseniev, Barbara Anderson, Nancy Black, Rick Koch, Jessica Krusiger, Steve Hauser, Cynthia Jones, Linda Mandeville, Betsy C., Stephen Sylvester, Judy Smith, Stephanie Smith, Denise Struber, and Dorothy Thompson. Congratulations, everyone. Next, Abby Bullish is going to present the President's Call to Service Awards. Abby? Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, um, this um, President's uh, Call to Service Awards um, this award is not from the Dallas County Association or the State Association, but it comes from the office of the President of the United States, regardless of who's holding the position. Um, it is to recognize over 4,000 hours of accumulated volunteer service to the community. Um, so due to COVID, Linda Alexander actually earned this award last year, but we're finally getting her award to her um, this year. Um, for 2019, Linda Alexander from the class of 2008 achieved this award. Um, thank you, Linda, for your continued service and your loyalty. Um, we value all that you do for the association and the community at large. Um, and for 2020, Carolyn Rozier from the class of 2002, and also uh, my mentor um, for the class of 2009, has achieved uh, the 4,000 hour award also. Carolyn is an active member of the Speakers Bureau, and we thank you both very much for your um, service. Back to you, Mary Kay. Mary Kay. Great. Well, now it's time for our new class badges. 
So the next slide, please. There we go. Congratulations to the class of 2015 who gets their fancy gold badges. I could swear some of these people have been around forever and have uh, definitely taken up leadership roles in our association. Thank you for hanging in there and we're glad to honor you with your new gold badge. Next. And congratulations to the class of 2010 for their 10-year platinum name badge. That's always fun honor to get the new badge, which is platinum. And congratulations to all of you that are so busy on so many different projects. Next. And to Elaine Ackley and Lynn Pesta for their 15 year badges. They are platinum and have one star on them. So when you start noticing the different badges, you'll see the different stars. They are from the class of 2005 and we're excited to have both of them still active in our group. Next. For the, from the class of 2000, Francis Atwood, Donna Marchant, Julia Rutledge, Jenny Salter, and Betsy Ann Tippett, we congratulate you for receiving your platinum badge with two stars for 20 years. That's awesome. Next. And a special recognition goes to our class of 1995. Oh my gosh, that's 25 years they've been doing this. Uh, their badge has three stars. It probably should have diamonds on it. We recognize Margaret Burnett, Rosie Kurtz, Judy Smith, and Julia Rutledge. Thank you ladies for being our mentors and our leaders. Next. Oh, everybody, this is our chance to turn on our video and unmute so that we can congratulate all of our fellow MGs who have been recognized today. Hooray! Hooray! Yay! Yay. 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 All right. I just right. meeting. There seemed to be a lot of Fantastic. people that stood up. Oh, yes. Remember? Okay. So be sure now you... Okay, uh, congratulations to everyone. That was really exciting. Thank you, um, Mary Kay, for that wonderful presentation. Um, thank you for attending this meeting and congratulations to all of the board mem all of a big thank you to everyone. Congratulations to all the award winners who have worked so hard for our organization. We applaud you. Um, and a big thank you to Teague Thompson for his statistical knowledge, keeping us up to date, to Jessica Kruger for her talent of all things video and audio, and Mary Kay Estep for once again being our MC. Thank you team for this wonderful awards presentation. And thank you Stephen for the Basil King of Herbs. Um, your awards and badges for 2019 and 2020 can be picked up from Rain Catchers Garden um, on Friday the 5th from noon to 3 p.m. or on Saturday the 6th from 12 to 3 in the front area by the um, front area by the demonstration beds. Um, all awards not picked up um, will be held um, by Jeff Raska at the Rowlett Extension. And to let you know, um, the upcoming March meeting will be a live Zoom in the evening on Wednesday, the 24th of March from 7 to 
and our speaker will be Stan Aiden. His topic will be the top 10 gardens in Texas, and he will have lots of pictures, and you can earn one CEU by attending that Zoom. Um, Stan comes recommended by a master gardener who saw his presentation at another venue. Um, anything else? I'll turn it back over to Jessica, and thank you very much for this meeting. Great, thanks everybody. We had 157 participants today. Have a great afternoon.